Well, I wonder if you've ever been in a situation or been in an experience where you're overwhelmed with the feeling, I don't belong. I don't belong here. I don't feel like I belong right now. You know, last week I told you a little bit about some of my shopping adventures at the store Justice. It's the store for little girls, the trendy young girl, if you will. And, uh, and you know, I want to get some wins with my little girls, so sometimes I take my little girls to this store, Justice, so that they could have a little bit of a shopping spree. And whenever I go to this store, I often get surrounded by young girls and their moms, and they're screaming and yelling about clothes and bows and rompers and jumpers and zip-ups and makeups and leggings and jangings. And as the only dad every single time I go into this store, I am always overwhelmed with the feeling, I don't belong here, right? <laughs> and I can also remember a time when my wife and I were dating. And uh, we were dating and things were getting kind of serious. And so I went over to her house, her parents' house, to pick her up for the date, but she wasn't quite ready yet. And so her dad opened up the door uh, to let me in and inform me that she wasn't quite ready yet and invited me to come and sit with him in the living room. Now, if you know a little bit about my history as a young youth pastor, I was dating the pastor's daughter. I was dating my boss's daughter. So there I am sitting with the pastor, my boss, while my wife was still getting ready for the date upstairs, and she was blow drying her hair for the date and having a conversation with her mom. Now, it's really hard to hear one another over a blow dryer, so they are yelling back and forth their conversation, which happened to be about engagement rings. So I am sitting in awkward silence with my pastor, my girlfriend's dad, my boss in this quiet living room as the discussion of engagement rings is being screamed aloud from upstairs. And I was overwhelmed with the feeling, I don't belong in this situation. You know, we were married for a few years and I wanted to surprise my wife with something special. And uh, at the time, she's not really so much now, but at the time she was really into Britney Spears. And so I thought that I would surprise her with some concert tickets to Britney Spears. Well, I had never been to a Britney Spears concert, nor have I ever been to a Britney Spears concert since. But I took my wife to this Britney Spears concert, and, uh, and I couldn't believe it. Uh, not only did I appear to be the only guy at this concert, but I have never seen so many grown women go absolutely insane. I mean, they went straight back to their teen years like fangirls going nuts over the songs of their youth, uh, while I think I was the only person sitting in the arena while I was eating some popcorn, being completely overwhelmed with the feeling, I absolutely do not belong here. I wonder if you've ever struggled with the feeling, I don't belong. I wonder if you've ever felt that way. You know, sometimes even in a crowded room, we could feel that way. I don't feel like I belong. You know, I could think of no time in my life that I struggled with the feeling uh, of desiring to belong and feeling like I don't belong more than when I was in middle school and then eventually in high school. You know, middle school was really tough for me. I was picked on a lot when I was in middle school. And although I've been out of middle school for about a little over 25 years now, you know, there's a funny thing about pain. You remember it like it was yesterday. And for me, it was the middle school cafeteria. See, I was bullied a lot at, at the lunch table in the middle school cafeteria. You know, it started with words, and then eventually it got to people, you know, throwing stuff. And then eventually it led to some physical violence. And I got to this point where I was even afraid to go and eat my lunch in the middle school cafeteria. So I started to do something kind of crazy. I started throwing pickles. You see, if you don't know this, pickles 
they stick to the windows in those, in those, those cafeterias at school. Pickles will stick to windows. And so I started taking my pickles and I started throwing them at the windows and get them to stick. Now when that didn't get enough attention, I started taking those pickles and I started throwing them at students. And when that didn't get the attention I wanted, I then took those pickles and I started throwing them at the teachers that would, that would look over at the lunch table and chaperone you know, the cafeteria. And finally, I got the attention I desired when I threw those pickles at the teachers, because I knew of a place called lunch detention. I knew of a place that I would get sent during lunch where I would feel safe to be able to eat my lunch, where I wouldn't be able to be picked on, where I could be alone. But all that did for me was reinforce this belief inside of me that I don't belong, that I am alone. You see, in my teen years, I discovered the hard way, a big truth in life, that no matter who you are, no matter where you were born, no matter what language you speak, no matter what you believe, or no matter what you don't believe, everyone in this world has a longing for belonging. Everyone in this world has a longing for belonging. Everyone longs to be liked. Everyone longs to be accepted. Everyone longs to be known. Everyone longs to be valued. Everyone longs to be loved. It's a basic need that is hardwired within us. It's a basic need that each and every one of us has, every single human being. You see, God made us this way. God made us this way, and he recognized it when he first made us. You know, everything that God made, he declared, was good. Everything that God made, he declared, was good. The first thing that God declared was not good was that Adam, the first person, was alone. God says this in Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. You see, we live in a broken world. We have broken bodies. We have a broken environment. We've suffered through broken economies. We've suffered loss. We've suffered broken friendships, and we've suffered broken relationships. In fact, if you think of the most pain that you have ever been in in your life, it probably involves some sort of loss in a relationship. The loss of a loved one, a friend stabbing you in the back, an estranged family member somewhere in your life, a broken relationship. See, that's why I think the worst punishment in prison is solitary confinement, to be cut off from human contact, to be cut off from relationships. And because we live in this broken world, we too are broken people. We mess up. We sin against God and against other people. We hurt other people, sometimes unintentionally, but if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we do it intentionally. You know, a lot of people uh, uh, in this broken world will, will mess up and realize that their relationship with God gets disconnected because that's the truth. This, this sin that's in our lives, this messing up that's in our lives, it actually causes our relationship with God to be severed. And a lot of people think that this is some kind of punishment from God, but that couldn't be further from the truth. You see, God is perfect and holy. He's perfect and holy. And the Bible says that because of this broken world, because of sin, because of our sinful nature, that even our good deeds are like dirty rags when compared to the holiness of God. It says this in Isaiah 64, we are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. You know, literally translated, that filthy rags means dirty diapers. That we, we, our lives, just because of our sinful nature, and you all know this when we think back upon ourselves. We, we are kind of like dirty diapers. We just can't seem to get it right, can we? No matter how hard we try, we just can't seem to get it right. Now imagine, imagine that God is like this, this white, 
perfect, clean piece of linen. Just absolutely perfect and clean. And we are these filthy rags, these, these dirty diapers. And imagine that you were to put the two of those things together. And imagine what were to happen. You know, I'm a youth pastor. And so what I actually do when I talk about this downstairs is I'll actually take a diaper and I'll take some chocolate pudding. Only I won't tell the teens it's chocolate pudding. And I'll put that into the diaper and I'll take a white piece of linen and I'll smash the two of them together to show what actually happens. You see, because when you put the two of them together, that white piece of linen, it will get dirty. And that's just an impossibility. It's an absolute impossibility for God to cease to be God, meaning it's an impossibility for God to cease to be perfect, to be clean, to be holy. And so therefore, because of this sinful nature, because of this mess that we are all trapped in, our relationship with God is severed. But here's the good news. This breaks God's heart. This breaks God's heart because he designed us to be in a relationship with him. He designed us to be in a relationship with him, and this severing of this relationship breaks God's heart. He knows the mess we're in. He doesn't like it. He's not happy about that, and he wants to do something about that. God designed you for a relationship with him. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love. That means that before God created the heavens and the earth, God had you and me on his mind. The Bible says that we are the focus of his love. You know, it never ceases to amaze me that God, the same God who put the stars in the sky, wants to have a relationship with me. How amazing is that? It blows my mind every single time I think what an idiot I am. And this God wants to have a relationship with me. And more than that, God designed us to belong to his family. Ephesians 1 continues in verse 5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. You see, we all have this longing for belonging deep inside of us because God designed us for a relationship with him and a relationship with his family. But somewhere along the way, that got broken. And we're longing for that to be repaired. So we have this broken relationship with God, and that has led to a broken relationship with his family. And the problem is, is when you don't have those two things in your life, that relationship with God and that relationship with God's family, you're going to feel empty. You're going to feel broken. Things in your life just aren't going to work. And if you're honest with yourself, if we are honest with ourselves, we all try to fill that emptiness in our lives with other things. You know, some of us try to fill it with pleasure. You know, we're looking for fun, maybe to feel a little less broken. Some people go even further and they get into drinking or they get into drugs in order to be able to kind of numb the pain of that brokenness. Some people turn to pornography or to sex to falsify the feeling of love so that they won't feel so lonely, so that they won't feel so empty. Some people try to fill that emptiness with pride. They need to feel important. They need to feel better than others. And they think this will fix their brokenness. Some people turn to popularity they think that if they're, they're liked by enough people, they won't feel so broken. And so they put up this kind of front or this, this kind of falseness. They change their behaviors so that they will be liked and wanted by others. Some people fill their lives full of possessions. They fill their lives with enough stuff. They want to have that next great thing, that desire of their heart. 
And they think that if they could only get that next thing, then they would be truly happy. Some people, it's all about performance. You know, they feel like if they're, they're the best, the very best at what they do, then they won't feel so empty. If I'm the best performer at work, if I get the best promotion, if I'm the best parent out there, if I have my kids involved in all of the activities, if I handle all the details of my life to the point of burning myself out, if I excel at everything I try, then maybe I won't feel so broken. Others turn to filling that emptiness with power. They search for power because they feel like, you know, if I don't, if I'm not going to be liked, if I'm not going to be loved, then I'm going to be feared or I'm going to be respected. I'm going to have power over others because then maybe these feelings of brokenness and emptiness will go away. But the Bible puts it this way in 1 John chapter 2. The world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievement and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. You know, the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, we all know this, that these things only make us feel good for a period of time, or, or they distract us from the emptiness for just a little while, but they don't really satisfy. That's where our scripture focus comes in today. That's where John, the gospel writer from the prologue of John, comes in today. That's where he writes in John 1, verse 10, He, that's Jesus, He came into this world, this very world that He created, but the world didn't recognize Him. He came to His own people, and even they rejected Him. But to all who believed Him and accepted Him, He gave the right to become children of God. There is so much packed into these words from John's Gospel. You see, God loved us so much. He wanted that relationship restored with us so much that He gave up His heavenly throne and He humbled Himself and He walked amongst us. He saw the mess that we were in and He said, that's not good, I'm coming down there. And He walked amongst us. That means that there's nothing that you and I go through that God cannot relate to because He walked amongst us. He experienced it. And just as everyone has this longing for belonging, just as everyone knows the feeling of rejection, Jesus too knows what it's like to be rejected. John, John says He was rejected by His own people, the very world that He created. If we're honest with ourselves, we too have rejected Jesus. But Jesus' ultimate purpose was to walk himself straight to the cross as a perfect sacrifice, to die a sinner's death. Why? So that we do not have to. He did this so that we could have a restored relationship with God. He did this so that we could have a restored relationship with God's family. As it says in John 1, so that all who believe and accept Him, He gave the right to become children of God. Those words, the right, that means that the legal adoption paperwork have been signed, sealed, and delivered to you. That you can call God Dad. That you get to call God Dad. That we belong to His family. That we all here get to belong to His family and we finally have a place to belong. That need and desire within all of us is finally fulfilled. You know, growing up in church, I had this feeling that I couldn't articulate until now. I felt like you had to behave a certain way and that you needed to believe in certain things about God and the Bible and, and only then could you really truly belong. And so I did a lot of things. I did a lot of going through the motions when I was young and in church. I did a lot of you know, showing up on Sundays and punching my church ticket 
standing when I was supposed to, sitting when I was supposed to, reading the right prayers when I was supposed to, acting the right way on Sundays, but living a completely different life the other six days of the week. And I went through those motions, and if I would be honest with you, I did a lot of faking it in church. You know, and to be honest with you, I, like a lot of people out there, felt like as long as I was going through these motions, or like Pastor Robbie said this morning, as long as I was playing church, as long as I went through the motions, I was going to be all right. I was going to be all right. That was the model that I grew up with. Behave, believe, then you get to belong. But that's not the way Jesus did ministry at all. In fact, that's not the gospel message at all. What that is, is that's religion. And religion isn't going to get you saved. And that's not what we're talking about here this morning. What we're talking about here is a relationship. A real relationship. A relevant relationship. A life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to be honest with you. When I was growing up in church, I believed in God. I believed He was real. But I did not have a real, relevant relationship with God. I did not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I graduated my faith, and I went off into the world, and I played in the world like my playground. And I, that whole list of things, that emptiness, I, I tried all those things to fill that inside. I did not have that relationship. Jesus' model was simple. Belong, believe, then become. See, all throughout the Gospels, we see so many examples of Jesus first welcoming people and then inviting them to come and see and inviting people to belong. You know, the first followers of Jesus, they belonged long before they believed. And then once they came to believe, that's eventually when they began to change the way they lived their life based on those beliefs, beliefs. I just want you to know something. No matter who you are, no matter how you've been living, I want you to know that this place right here, this is a place where you can belong. This is a place where you can belong. This is a place where you can feel free to come and just as Jesus said, come and see what it's like to live life God's way. I want you to know that. But I also know that there might be some people in this room who are just like me growing up. There might be some people in this room who are just like me growing up who have come on Sunday after Sunday and for whatever reason have yet to begin a real relevant relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, we've had some incredibly powerful weeks here these past few months full of people making decisions for Jesus Christ. It's been amazing. But maybe you've been a little bit like I was. Maybe you've been feeling that and you've been taking that in and maybe you've been feeling like God has been tugging at your heart but for whatever reason you have not yet made that decision for Christ. Maybe you haven't pulled that trigger yet. I just want to encourage you, don't wait any longer. Don't let your head hit the pillow tonight without making that decision. Let today be the day. Fulfill that longing for belonging in your life today. God is calling you. He's calling you for a restored relationship with Him. He's calling you for a restored relationship with His family. You know, beginning a relationship with Christ is just like beginning a relationship with anybody else. It starts with a conversation. We just call that conversation prayer. It starts with a conversation. And all it is is just acknowledging what we've read in our scripture focus today. It's just acknowledging the fact that we believe, that we believe in him, that we accept the free gift of salvation that he paid for us. And therefore we admit, we just admit that, hey, we've been in charge of our lives. We've been in charge of our lives and we've been kind of messing it up. And so now we want, to be, we want God to be in charge of our lives. We want to invite him into our life. Romans 10.9 says this, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So as I close us in prayer today, I just want to give an opportunity to anybody out there who may have been like me growing up in church. 
I want to give an opportunity to anybody out there to talk to God with me right now. To begin that relationship today before your head hits the pillow tonight. But I would encourage you in this. That before you leave this room today, if you begin that relationship with Christ today, I would just encourage you to come up and find me. Come up and find Pastor Robbie. Find one of our prayer partners, maybe a trusted Christian friend in the room today. And as it says in Romans 10, to openly declare that relationship with Jesus. Just let us know. Let us have the honor and privilege to, to hear that from you, to pray with you, to congratulate you, to hear your story. Let's go to God in prayer here this morning. God, I believe in you. I believe you created me. I believe you want what's best for me. And I believe that you love me. God, I'm sorry. I've been living life my way, filling my life with selfish desires and selfish living. And God, I gotta be honest, I've been making a mess with it. I've been filling that emptiness with pleasure and prideful thoughts, seeking after popularity or possessions, searching for fulfillment in my performance or in power. But God, I believe that you sent your son to die in my stead so that I could have a life-changing, life-saving relationship with you. And God, I've been thinking about that. I've been exploring that for a while. And God, it's time. I want to begin that relationship with you today. So God, I ask that you would forgive me because I no longer want to be in charge of my life. I want to give it to you. I want to be your follower. I don't know what's ahead of me. I don't know exactly what that means just yet. But I know that I can finally have meaning and purpose. And I can have a restored relationship with you. I could belong to your family. And I get to finally call you dad. And I want that in my life. Thank you, Father God. I love you. And so, God, as we're about to stand and sing a final song to you, would you hear from all of us here this morning how much we do love you, how much we thank you that you have paved a way that you have restored our relationship with you, that you have called us to your family, that you have fulfilled that longing for belonging in our life. God, we want to declare as we sing to you that we do love you and we thank you and we praise you and we worship you here this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.